I can. I yes, recording has started. I welcome you all to the Google Summer of Code 2020 project. Uh, this is the weekly sync for the project, and uh, we will discuss the action items first. So, the first action, pending action item that we had was to update the project details, current day details. I believe uh, Rishitesh has raised a PR on the Jenkins IO repo to do this. And uh, I have reviewed it. I was assuming that Mark, if you would have some time to do that, we could wait for your review. But if you think it looks good, then we could probably uh, move forward and merge it. Get it merged, right? I mean, I could do that. Yes, so, and I'll I, I'll do a review, and if you've already reviewed it, I think my review will be quite quite rapid, just to be sure it formats correctly, and then I'll merge it. I'll try to do that before I go to sleep tonight. Okay. Um. So apart from that, we there was some doubts that Rishikesh had related to you. And these were action items upon me to help him on this, but unfortunately I could not. I did not find the time because I was, so there was another action item that Rishikesh did. He wanted to understand the descriptive describable pattern that is implemented across Jenkins. And uh, to do this, I, I myself had to go deep into the Jenkins code code and understand the pattern. So I, Realized that during my time, uh, you know, I was I, I never um, I, I I remember I had to use this the descriptors we have to use it, but I was never the, you know I never explored it to the depth that I should have to explain this pattern. So I created a small gist uh, with with whatever I, I could find with my explorations, and I hope that it serves as a start starting point for him to understand the pattern. So, Rishikesh, I wanted to ask, do you still have these doubts or were you able to resolve them? Uh, the UI, I haven't, again, worked on the UI because, you know, based on the implementation, you know, the, U, the UI is based on the implementation. So, I I paused, uh, you know, the implement, implementation for now and I've created a design document, you know, the, uh, explaining two uh, ways of implementation that is using cron syntax or you know using the build discarder so okay. that was what i've done this entire week so then it feels like that rishab and i should review the design document uh, do you want to give us a summary of the the concepts that you found different between the two and do you have a particular one that you recommend for Shikesh? Uh, uh, I have shared the link exact in the Gitter channel. Uh, one minute, I can share it here. Yes. Um, yeah. So, uh, so basically, uh, this was, you know, to just, uh, you know, explain the difference between both the strategies. Uh, the global build discarder, the aim of the global build discarder is, you know, to schedule maintenance tasks without having a cron syntax in the UI. Okay, it is, auto it is done intelligently by Jenkins internally. Uh, the cron syntax, you know, uh, administrators have to pass, you know, uh, uh, you know, cron syntax for each maintenance task, uh, in in that strategy. So the global build discarder, uh, here, uh, I I have written and uh, you know, a working of how exactly it works. I was going through the documentation. So basically, if you check, there is a a, a what do you tell a, a class called background global build discarder yeah that that, that uh so this uh, background global dis, uh, build discarder it executes every hour there is this uh, uh, method called get rec uh, recurrence period 
okay which is uh, which is uh, currently by default set to hour so uh, every every hour this uh, uh, this thing runs and it calls the execute method this execute method calls the process job okay it gets it check it checks all the jobs in the uh, jenkins on the jenkins controller uh, and then it, it checks whether this job is uh, applicable for a global uh, for you know discarding the previous builds which have been uh, present or not if if you go to uh, uh, rishav can you go to the design document yeah so in the second step, yeah, it, it calls the execute function hourly and runs the build discarder on all the jobs present on the Jenkins controller. Uh, it, it is based on the strategy present in the global build discarder. Okay, so basically there is a, a function which we need to, uh, you know, over uh, overwrite that is the is applicable function, which the user needs to set. If the user sets this, uh, so basically whichever uh, functionality he, up, uh, he writes in the is applicable function, that configuration is used by Jenkins internally to decide whether uh, it should this, you know, run the build discarder on that job or not. This is the basic functionality of the global build discarder. I was thinking we can use the same functionality for, you know, uh, what do you tell? Uh, maintenance tasks as well but i was having few questions regarding this because global build discarder is only used for jobs it's only used to iterate over jobs so is there any ways you know where is there any way where we can use it for caches as well i i don't know of a way directly to use that but i would think that its implementation would could be used and we may have to do a new implementation that says, okay, we're going to use global build discarder as our pattern and copy its code or duplicate relevant portions of its code into the Git plugin to iterate over Git caches. But, but I think I'd assume that you were thinking here, huh, because global build discarder happens every hour, would we then in the UI have the user choose something, you know, how, how frequently they want it, whether it's hourly or every two hours, every 24 hours, every 48 hours, and then skip it on those hours when it's not selected? What was your, what was your vision for people who don't want to run caching every hour? Uh, so what I was thinking, uh, I was thinking of running it. And uh, so first, my thought process was, you know, now whenever it runs every hour, I was thinking, uh, first of all, you know, I don't, I didn't want it to overload the system. Okay. So I was thinking that is there any way where we can find the CPU utilization, how much CPU has been used or how much RAM has been consumed so that, you know, based on that data, we can, you know, schedule, uh, you know, the maintenance tasks, uh, hourly or, you know, every three hours and let the user even, you know, uh, Get, uh, have an option of scheduling it weekly, something like that. I, that was what I was thinking. I'm not sure about how we would. Uh, uh, is there any other intelligent ways of scheduling maintenance tasks? No, uh, uh, I was, I was say, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I was just saying that I think we should divide this into two steps. As Mark, the first thing that Mark asked is that as we decided during the initial project, right? That, there, there, we are going to expose a way for the user to be able to set a schedule for these tasks, right? Hmm. So the when you talk about CPU utilization and then the system having the intelligence to be able hmm. to schedule the jobs on the basis of the current status of the system, I hmm. believe that is something that we can implement when, when we know how to implement a scheduled job based on the user's Okay. So I, I, I think we should take this step by step. Okay. We don't have to make it intelligent at the first, the get go at the first uh, iteration of this uh, uh, feature as well, right? We, we can start with the first goal, which, which I believe, please correct me if I'm wrong, was to take the user's uh, input on, on what is the frequency with which they want to schedule these jobs and then yeah. use that 
input to run the tasks and not think about um, I mean, if we could think about it, it's great, but it, it's okay if we don't think about uh, seed utilization at the first step. Uh, would you agree, Mark? I do. I think that's a, that's, that's a, I think we'll need the CPU utilization or the, the overload prevention, no matter which scheduling technique we use. So I think, I think considering them as separate steps is a good idea. Okay. okay. I mean, I just wanted to, uh, what my point was to, you know, as, as a steps and requirements, we know that, okay, first we need to do that. And uh, parallelly as a feature, we could figure out how to do, how to uh, understand how to get the metrics from the system to be then able to, uh, you know, build it, build, uh, like build in some fail safes so that we don't go, uh, you know, uh, we don't uh, affect the system. Yeah, no. Push cache in terms of, I'm not sure that the CPU load is is the crucial measure there i would or and and even if it is it may be difficult to get that in a platform independent way i think though mm -hmm. we can get how long did the sub process run before it completed and the duration of the of the run of a sub process gives us a, a first first level approximation of how much demand it placed on that on that computer so we know when it started and we'll, we'll be monitoring its exit code. So we'll know when it finished. And the difference between those two is the duration of that process in terms of its wall clock execution. However many CPUs or cores it had available to, to use. But I think, I think Rishab is right that it's probably much more important that we do the first step and get it, get confidence there before we worry about optimizing to not overload. So Rushikesh, did that answer your question? Yeah, uh, uh, so I have a doubt. So basically, uh, uh, the what you tell, uh, finally, are we like uh, the UI in the UI? Are we going to what what kind of UI are we looking into? Are we looking into you know uh, taking you know uh, cron syntax from the administrator to schedule maintenance tasks, or do you want the uh, uh, do you want the maintenance tasks to be run automatically without having a input from the administrator i was assuming we wanted the administrator to have some control of the frequency okay i don't know that we want a cron syntax i, I or maybe maybe i should say it differently a cron syntax may be more precise than we're actually ready to use uh, for instance, I think it would be disastrous or at least at minimum very unwise if they scheduled it to run every minute. Yeah. So if, if, we, if we went with um, the global, if we went with the global build discarder concept and so it checks every hour is there work to be done and then if the job configuration said only do that every 24th hour or every 48th mm -hmm. hour that might be ad might be enough and then we we don't need to process cron syntax now i'm not sure that jenkins users jenkins users may say well but i had to learn cron syntax everywhere else and and they'd be right it's just, I, I have a hard time imagining us running cache maintenance more than once an hour. And maybe, I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding there. What's your thought on it? Do you think that there will be interesting use cases that require it to run more than once an hour? 
Oh, I, I don't, it depends on the repository. If the repository isn't that big or if it isn't frequently updated, it I don't think it would make sense to run it every hour. So. Yeah, that was, I agree with your, your observation, at least for me, I have a hard time imagining a repository that is busy enough that refreshing its cache every hour would be would be important and even more difficult to envision that refreshing its cache every every few minutes would be worthwhile oh, or we can give an option where you know we can run it not hourly or you know on a daily basis or some you know to or something configurable by the administrator because the aim of the global build discarder is to not have cron syntax. It, it has to be done by Jenkins internally. The other implementation provides cron syntaxes for the uh, you know, administrator where he can where they can plug in uh, the cron syntaxes and run the maintenance tasks. So that mm -hmm. that's the whole uh, difference between both the strategies. Wait, I, well, I just and... tried... Go ahead, Rishi. Go ahead, Rishi. I just wanted to say on this point of uh, how do we decide to schedule these jobs or what is the frequency is going to be. I, I believe we should uh, test this uh, idea by uh, when we build this feature, we should run this on Mark's machine, which has a lot of projects. Um, I, I believe we should take inputs from that, from that machine on how the, the, the frequencies that we're trying to whatever frequencies that we are assuming should be uh, uh, you know optimal for the system we should uh, i believe it will be a good uh, practical test for us to know how it's actually going to work on a user's machine and if our frequency is not um, um, uh, you know the optimal range that we want it to so it, it could be a test that we could see uh, run on your machine and then see how uh, you know the system metrics, how they are performing on the frequency that we've uh, decided could be our year, could be a day to day basis. Or do we need to reduce them or can we reduce them? I'm certainly willing to, to be a test case. I, I'd be honored to be a test case, not just willing. That, that would be a real privilege. So if if my little installation is is a, a of use, I'm happy to do it. And yes, it does have several, uh, in, in some cases, rather embarrassingly large repositories that it's caching. Yes, so I, I, I believe it would be a good exercise to understand, understand the relationship between the maintenance, maintenance tasks and how they uh, how they're affected by the size of the repository or the other parameters which are defined within the repositories. And then if you have a large number of size of repositories, how, how do you know this is the, the task that you've decided how they're going to interact with the system, how much resources they're going to uh, take? I mean, I, I was just listening to the, uh, the question that we're trying to answer, right? What the frequency should be. And I thought that before, without trying actually these tasks on a machine at that scale, how would we understand? How can we answer that question? I, um, and and I think that sound that sounds very good to me. Now, I'm not sure the answer to that question resolves which path Rushikesh should take, whether global global build discarder or cron syntax, because I can see arguments for, for either. So the, please, uh, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, the cron syntax allows us to uh, essentially, it allows us a way for us to uh, decide the frequency, uh, decide the frequency uh, on a more granular level than me exposing a way for them to just say that, okay, every one hour or every five hours or every 10 hours, right? Correct. For instance, I can, with cron syntax, I can say things like from the second and fourth Thursdays of the month. 
those kind of things. Mm -hmm. I think anyway. So it's so yes, it is much more sophisticated than the the simple hourly scheme that the global build discarder uses. So it, it and Crown Syntax is very very rich in Jenkins. It has keywords like at daily, where it says run it sometime during the day, or at hourly, or at weekly, and and so it it has it has a level of sophistication that is certainly very 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 powerful. So, uh, so Rishikesh, as I understand, you know, the primary goals that we have for this project is to is to do the heavy work, heavy lifting behind the system of running these tasks. But for the user, we want to provide a way for them to configure these tasks, right? Yeah. Using a UI. And if that is the aim, then more customizability especially when that feature affects the performance of the system. Like more granularity could mean that the admin would have more options to, um, to essentially um, find out the, let's say we don't, our frequency or whatever we think the default, default frequency is, is not the one that should be implemented in their system. So what I'm trying to say is that the Tron syntax would allow us allow the user more freedom to decide for themselves what is the best uh, way for them to run these tasks instead of us giving standards, slots, or something like that. Hmm. So, so do you, so, do you so, so I, then I would say I would prefer the second strategy because it provides more customization. For that administrator, yeah. Yeah, Rushikesh, back to the, an earlier question, would you be okay if you, uh, are you, do you have something that causes you to lean towards one choice or the other? Uh, not, 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 nothing out of that sort. I've uh, gone, actually, the, uh, I've gone through the entire uh, cron syntax implementation and I'm, pretty much confident of, of implementing it. Uh, that's uh, There's no favoritism as that sort. I'm still a bit uh, confused about the global build discarder, like what are the various conditions based on which we are going to implement the maintenance tasks. So. so with the second strategy, strategy Rishikesh, where we can use the cron syntax, hmm. In the parameterized schedule of plugins. So there are the same way that they've uh, we've seen in the global build discarder strategy, there are hooks exposed to run uh, processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, or you know, we can uh, we can create our own asynchronous thread by extending the you know async time uh, p uh, async uh, periodic work. There there's that yeah, if, if, if you extend to that, you can create your own background process and uh, run, and then run the maintenance ta task in that thread. So what you say is that the second uh, strategy that you have, the second implementation, the difference would be somewhere in this contract. Right? Yeah, the exactly. The period would be divided by a um, uh, cron syntax and not yeah. here what would happen is uh, in in that in the param in the cron syntax implementation there would be one thread which would be running every minute which would check every minute whether the cron syntax is valid or not if it is valid and then uh, uh, the corresponding maintenance task is run on all the repositories so. So in terms of implementation, the, diff, the, the core difference between these two options is the usage of cron syntax mm -hmm. and, and no other uh, differences that you've seen, right? No, I, I didn't get you. Can you repeat? I, I just wanted to ask, uh, mm -hmm. am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. I just wanted to ask if the, the only difference between these two implementations is the ability to use cron syntax. Apart from that, yeah. 
we could use the same, we could extend the same contract to uh, iterate over all the jobs and then. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Both of, yeah, exactly. The rest of the implementation is same. The only main feature would be, are we taking the cron syntax from the user uh, administrator and scheduling it? Or do we intelligently schedule it behind the scenes in Jenkins? Mm. And that we believe could, for us, could be a step-by-step -step approach. That sounds very reasonable to me. I think cron-based syntax, it feels like you've done a very good job of exploring it, Hoshikesh. Uh, we, we even, you know, we can uh, safeguard cron syntax, uh, like uh, I, uh, as I've stated in one meet that uh, assume uh, uh, an administrator runs a GC every minute. Okay, his, his syntax is corresponding to every minute or every 30 minutes. We can safeguard by putting some uh, rules behind the scenes where, you know, he can uh, start, uh, you know, uh, running maintenance task only, uh, you know, like a base from hourly, he can start at like one hour, 30 minutes, one hour, one minute, something like that, so that he doesn't overload the system. Mm -hmm. Alternately, you could put a limiter in that says, uh, if a current, th if there is currently a maintenance thread running, I will refuse to start a new thread. Yeah. yeah. Scheduled. Or uh, as we discussed, we can add it into a queue and then, you know, dequeue it right. and then yeah yeah even better you're right not not just just queue it and then somehow report. use the same thread right exactly yeah good point very good So, um, what so, uh, so we've discussed, so I, I believe that we're taking more towards the parameterized plugin using the wrong syntax approach. Sorry, Rishab, I missed part of that sentence. You said something about the cron syntax ap approach. Could you say that again? I was just saying that we're tilting more towards uh, user with preferring the second approach, right? The parameterized back and using cron syntax approach. I, th I think yeah. so, yeah. And and as, as, as Hrushikesh noted, some safeguards only have a single thread that's processing these so that we are forcibly rate limited, we can never have more than one running at a time, that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, I uh, I have a question um, uh, related to using a single thread um, the execution of these jobs. Mm -hmm. So how how do we so if we are not using multiple threads, 
let's say I have 60 repositories and I have these five tasks um, to perform, uh, let's say within a day. So when I start running them, iterating through the repositories, um, if I'm using a single thread, would we run in a chance of increasing the time of execution for these tasks. I am not to a point where it is unfeasible, infeasible because we, we this these are background processes. So we don't have to worry how much. Um, okay, so the question would be first of all, do we worry about how much time the uh, does these tasks are taking? And do we put put an upper upper limit to those uh, to those time periods. For an example, if, if GC has started to run on a particular repository on a single thread and it's taking, I don't know, five hours. So do we, do we have some kinds of uh, upper limits where we say that, okay, you know, we can't proceed forward. Considering the fact that it might take five days for the whole batch of tasks to run on these 60 repositories. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not immediately visualizing why we would want to put an upper bound. Uh, I can imagine someone's decided to compile the Linux kernel for their Raspberry Pi. And mm. as part of that, they're doing a garbage collection operation on the two gigabyte Linux kernel repository on their Raspberry Pi controller. And it may take many hours, but they get the benefit that when it's done, it's it's done. Uh, tell, tell me more about cases where you worry that it, you're worried that, hey, they may have many copies of that and therefore they might somehow not be able to complete the other work. So, um, I, uh, Mark, my only cons my concern is, uh, I think it's born out of uh, uh, this um, this assumption that I have that let's say there are uh, between the two scheduled frequencies that we have for the whole batch of maintenance tasks. How do we guarantee that all of the tasks that we have decided that are going to run for all of the repositories within the system? run before the next frequency uh, scheduled uh, time for them to run since we're doing this on a single thread and i thought that the answer there was that that because there's a stack or a queue that mm -hmm. that won't allow the next task to begin until its predecessor has completed and mm -hmm. and for me that was okay that means that if they've scheduled them to occur too rapidly, they will queue and the work will be done when, 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 when the first maintenance task completes, the second will begin if it was scheduled to begin earlier. And same for third, fourth, and fifth. Now, now, I don't know that we want an unbounded queue because in that case, it's just queuing to do work that, well, yeah, if the degenerate case that you're describing were to happen where processor and file system combination is so slow or large repositories are so, so large that the, the work simply cannot be completed in in the you know if the if the if the controller were continuously falling further and further behind in processing its queue of maintenance tasks there's no point in making that queue very deep it will just work on them when it can does it, yes have i yes have i talked to your yeah. question rishab or no Correct. Correct. Yes, but I, as you've said, it's a, it's a case which could be an extreme case. So I don't know if it's something that we should, uh, you know, prepare for right now. But I, the 
the, this question that I'm trying to ask is only because, so let's say currently in my system, if Git GC is going to run, my limited knowledge is that it's going to use whatever resources that I have on my system to run that process. It's not going to be a single threaded process. I, that's my understanding as well. Git GC, Git GC, command line Git GC is specifically written to use multiple cores if the uh, if the the computer has multiple cores, and so it will run portions of the garbage collection in parallel. Yes. So when we are saying that we are going to limit our jobs in a single threaded. Um, process then we what are we for we are foregoing the execution time right we are increasing the execution time for these individual tasks so uh, i i was uh, I, I i think i i don't know if if it works like that but i was thinking when i schedule a maintenance task using you know the git client plugin it calls the underlying git command line present on your system which runs a separate process to run the maintenance task and once that maintenance task gets run you get the result into the git client plugin so that was what i was thinking mm. me me too and that makes sense the fork no ma please decides to use multiple threads and it does our multiple cores and it does that independent of Jenkins, unless we were to somehow configure it to do less than that. That makes sense. That answers my question. I was not thinking, uh, you know, in that way. Yeah. Okay. I, it's still, it's, we're only putting a single command line Git process, forking a single command line Git process, but then that process chooses to use multiple cores as it sees, as it feels to do so. Correct. Correct. That's true. That's true. I was thinking that it'd be way somehow allocating a single thread to the Git command line operations, but that is not happening. Yes. Here, I was worried about this, like, uh, if I run a, get, uh, you know, a GC command, you know, and that you know, over, you know, it consumes a lot of resources on the, of the computer. Uh, would that, uh, I think that would be a problem, right? Like it would, it would consume like 90% of CPU, you know, making the computer a bit slow. Uh, I was not sure about how, how do you proceed with that? Or is, is that fine for now? I'm not sure what do you do with that? My opinion was that's fine because what we're doing is delegating to command line git and if that is a problem for the user we would invite them to change the scheduling and that argues for the cron syntax change the scheduling so that it only happens during periods when they reasonably the system is idle or is less busy Now on a system like ci.jenkins.io, uh, those are not regularly predictable times, but there is some pattern to them. Or, you know, we can uh, read uh, like the frequency of how, how, you know, free, when exactly the system is idle and then, you know, give a recommend the administrator based on that, uh, you know, whether, uh, you know, so that he, they can schedule the maintenance tasks. Good point. Yes. Uh, if, and there may be some historical data like that available since Jenkins itself does predict load statistics or does present load statistics um, for at least the last two days.
Also, I had another doubt uh, regarding the Git Cashier. So basically, when I create a freestyle job on the a freestyle job uh, in the Jenkins uh, UI, it creates a separate workspace work directory which contains the entire repository. Whereas if I use a multi-branch pipeline, it only creates a caches folder. So here we are only worried about the caches, right? Not uh, regarding the uh, uh, freestyle repositories which is present on the Jenkins controller. Correct, because it's an it is strongly advised to not have any jobs that execute on the Jenkins controller. And so having us perform any maintenance on jobs that the user makes the mistake of running on the controller, I think is, is a, a, would be a bad pattern. It's, we only want to deal with caches that are maintained by Jenkins core itself, not with freestyle jobs that the user constructed. Okay. Did that address your question, Hoshigesh? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Yeah, so I agree wholeheartedly with you that we should only do multi-branch, we should only do caches on the on the controller, not job workspaces. Also, yesterday I was, uh, 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 you know, uh, just messing around, uh, so, uh, the, you know, trying to make an implementation. So there I tried to save the entire uh, data, which I've got, uh, like the cron syntax, which I've taken from the user and, uh, you know, stored it as an XML file. Can this XML file be changed by other users on, uh, like, if, if that computer doesn't belongs to that administrator, can some other people change that XML file? Asking, you know, just for security for reason. Certainly J Jenkins configuration files can be modified by anyone who has permission to modify them. The next time Jenkins starts, those configuration files will be read. Okay. So, so, so if, yes. if any... So if any malicious user tried to change the cron syntax in that configuration file, would it affect the uh, Jenkins software? Yes, that's correct. Oh, okay. So UI-based validation is good, uh, and but is, is certainly necessary, but probably not sufficient. At the low levels of the API, we want to, we'll we'll want to be sure that we're we're using we're checking the data the schedule that's proposed for sanity there as well. The other reason for that is configuration as code uh, allows those kind of configurations also, and then the user might have the administrator writing the configuration as code definition might have made a mistake that causes it to now be scheduled every minute, something like that. So yeah, we, we if, if there are safeguards at the UI, um, we usually what happens is safeguards at the UI are also implemented in the API and the UI just presents a pretty error message of the same, the same safeguard. Yeah. any other topics we need to discuss today? So now we are, uh, so now we are more favored towards parameter, you know, cron syntax approach. So I can, you know, uh, so uh, I, 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 I can, you know, start exploring more about it. Uh, as what I was thinking. That's what was, there's, you know, this weekend's 
agenda you know to fix the architecture so that we can proceed on you know how we would implement and that sounds very good to me Rishikesh. thanks for doing that exploration and thank you for for having re researched global build discarder versus the uh, scheduled tasks interfaces those uh, well done Now, timeline-wise, I believe we're about to start the official coding phase, aren't we? Yeah, I, it's, it's going to start on June 13th, the coding phase. 13th, okay. And are you are you feeling like you've got enough that you're ready to start start the coding? E e yes, ma'am. Great. I, I apologize. It's it's approaching 11 p.m. my time and. I'm I'm not nearly as awake as the two of you tend to be at this hour of the night. <laughs> there are not any other pending. I, I, don't, yeah, I don't have any other questions. I think we can wind up the session if you have one mark. All right. Then I'll go ahead and stop.